it's certainly nice to be here with all of you today. I wish it could be in person, and hopefully next year we'll be together in person for this course. But I remain quite honored and privileged to have the opportunity to share with you today some of my thoughts on myocardial imaging, tissue Doppler, and strain imaging. And so as not to be distracting for the remainder of this recording, I will remove the personal video. I have no relevant financial relationships with which to disclose. Now there has long been a great interest to identify markers of an early change in myocardial function that may predict the development of a subsequent decline in left ventricular ejection fraction or the progression to the clinical syndrome of heart failure. And myocardial imaging, strain imaging, may be that warning that there are changes ahead. Now Doppler tissue imaging is really a way of measuring myocardial velocities and, and this schematic illustrates the principles behind Doppler tissue imaging, whereby this white bar here represents the high intensity but low velocity signals that are coming from the myocardium or the wall. The gray bar represents the higher velocity but lower intensity signals that are coming from the blood pool. Now in spectral blood pool Doppler, that is this white bar is considered noise in the signal, right? So what do we need to do? We simply need to turn the wall filters on to remove these low velocity signals. But in Doppler tissue imaging, that's in fact the signal we're interested in. So what do we do? We turn the wall filters off, and now to get rid of what would be considered noise in the signal coming from the spectral blood pool, we just simply turn down the receiver gains. So in Doppler tissue imaging, on the instrument, what we need to do is to turn the wall filters off, and turn down the receiver gains. Here we see an example of septal myocardial velocity tracings, sample volume placed in the base, the mid, the apical portion of the septum. We see the systolic velocities towards the apex or transducer, here the early diastolic relaxation or E-prime velocity, and then the late diastolic myocardial velocity associated with atrial contraction or the A-prime velocity. Note that there is a base to apex gradient in velocity, and this would be a problem if you wanted to use velocity for making a diagnosis, as then you'd have to determine normal values for each segment. Therefore, velocity analysis, aside from perhaps measuring the E-prime velocity and using this in diastolic function assessment, is not so much used in daily practice. So there is this base to apex velocity gradient, highest in the basal segments, lowest in the apical segments. Note, when we go on to talk about strain imaging, there is an apex to, badian, apex to base gradient, where strains are highest in the apical segments and lowest in the basal segments. And this may be important if you have a foreshortened apical image and you're not truly capturing the strain at the true LV apex, you may underestimate these strain values. Now here we are seeing curved M mode using the principles of color tissue Doppler. And what we've done here is we've traced the myocardium from the annulus here all the way around to the other side. And then on the right, we're displaying the distribution of these velocities in the various segments over time. So if I wanted to know what's happening between points five and six, I'd come down here between points five and six. Here's the QRS, so this is systole velocities are red going towards the apex or transducer. Here we see the early diastolic relaxation or E prime velocity going away from the apex or transducer. And here the A prime velocity due to atrial contraction. Now the goal is to detect regional wall motion. So if I place a sample volume here in that basal segment, I can obtain velocities from that various region and display it either as a curved M mode where a line is drawn along that segment of the myocardium and all the color changes along that line over time are displayed or a point and displayed graphically as you see down here uh, below. Now as we get started we have to realize then that there are different methods which which to obtain a derived parameter such as the early diastolic mitral annular velocity as we see here or the E prime velocity. On the left using pulse wave tissue Doppler we get a E prime uh, amplitude parameter of 14 centimeters per second. On the right same patient sample volume placed in that basal 
uh, medial segment, we get an E prime velocity of 11 centimeters per second. And that kind of makes sense because remember that with color Doppler, we are measuring mean velocities. And with pulse wave tissue Doppler, we are measuring peak velocities. And we're reminded that, for example, when using the amplitude parameter of E prime and applying it to the diastolic function guidelines, for example, we are using pulse wave tissue Doppler. Now there are pitfalls to velocity analysis, issues of translational motion and tethering. So with translational motion, if you have a sample volume placed in that basal segment, but the whole heart moves within the chest wall, there will be velocity associated with that motion, but it may not represent true compression or contraction. On the right, we see an example of tethering, where the sample volume is placed in that akinetic basal segment. But if the mid and apical segments are functioning fine, as they contract, they will tug, they will pull, they will tether that basal segment with them. There will be velocity associated with that motion, but it may not represent true compression or contraction. So to overcome this, we can look at more local parameters of deformation, things such as myocardial strain. And this formula here can be used to define longitudinal strain. So for example, if I have an object of an original length, let's say it's 10 centimeters, and it gets shorter in relation to its original length, goes from 10 to eight centimeters. Using this formula, you'd say, okay, eight minus 10, that's minus two over 10, that's a minus 20% change in length. If it gets longer in relation to its original length, so it goes from 10 to 12 centimeters, that's a positive 20% change or strain. No change in length, no strain. Strain rate is a completely different parameter. It is the rate at which these objects either shorten or lengthen. So here, for example, we see Dr. Orajema starting at the start line, chugging to the finish line. Dr. Lang comes in and actually smokes him at the end. The point being is that they both covered the same distance. They have an equal strain. It's just that Dr. Orajema moved a little slower than Dr. Lang and therefore has a lower strain rate. So it is entirely possible to have an equal strain, but a different strain rate. So then how do we measure or determine this parameter of strain? And one method is a Doppler-based technique, where we simply measure velocities along the scan line as we've just shown using Doppler tissue imaging. And then the spatial derivation or that velocity gradient gives a strain rate. Real-time integration of this, it then gives us this derived parameter of strain. Now, some of the limitations to using these Doppler-based techniques are the fact that if we want to look at a global evaluation of the left ventricle, we're going to have to place multiple sample volumes throughout the myocardium to get a global assessment of the left ventricle. This then is very time consuming and requires a lot of processing. Also, it requires a dedicated image to get a Doppler tissue imaging. And lastly, there may be issues of any movement of the myocardium relative to that sample volume that is truly fixed in space. And this can become an issue as we begin to see when trying to evaluate things such as circumferential strain, where that sample volume may slide off that particular area as the heart moves. So to overcome this, we can look at things such as speckle tracking, which allows us to look at both longitudinal, circumferential, and as well even radial uh, parameters of motion. So speckle tracking uses then a completely different approach than Doppler tissue imaging. This is an image analysis method, whereby we really identify a unique acoustic fingerprint, a, a pattern of individual speckle elements of the myocardium, and we track this pattern frame by frame. This allows us then to define the parameter of deformation truly in the axis of motion as opposed to the axis of the ultrasound beam. So speckle tracking, sort of by principle and definition, would be angle independent. This helps to illustrate this. In this study, we see here on the left an apical three-chamber view and a subcostal three-chamber view in very similar derived parameters of global longitudinal strain. On the right, the apical four-chamber view, a subcostal four-chamber view, and again, very similar derived parameters of global longitudinal strain.
highlighting the point that speckle tracking is somewhat angle independent. So the strengths of Doppler tissue imaging techniques are really its excellent temporal resolution. But as we said, deformation must be aligned to the ultrasound beam. It requires a dedicated image. Comprehensive evaluation is very time consuming because we'd have to look at multiple regional measurements and it can be quite noisy. On the right, we see speckle tracking. It can be done from a standard grayscale image. It does have a slightly lower temporal resolution than with Doppler techniques. As shown, it's angle independent. You can look at regional and global measurements, but there is intervendor variability. And now, which is nice, there are semi and fully automated tracking algorithms. Now for clinical use, myocardial deformation is described with three essentially orthogonal components, longitudinal, longer or shorter, radial, becoming thicker or thinner, or circumferential, rotating either in an anti-clockwise or a clockwise direction. By definition, objects that get shorter, thinner, rotate in an anti-clockwise direction are assigned negative values. They get longer, thicker, rotate in a clockwise direction, they are assigned positive values. Now, because regional pathology often influences all three strain components, the component with the most robust measurement is best chosen. And, and for clinical practice, this is generally longitudinal strain because radial and circumferential strain analysis may not have sufficient reproducibility for clinical practice. So to derive global longitudinal strain using speckle tracking techniques, we take the standard grayscale apical three, four, and two chamber views. Each view is then arbitrarily broken up into six segments and the percent regional shortening or strain is derived. The results are then generally displayed in this parametric bullseye map such that we can see that in the basal anterior segment shortened by 16% or strain is minus 16% say the mid inferior wall shortened by 27% or strain is minus 27%. And when we average all segments, we then derive this parameter of global longitudinal peak systolic strain. So now we have two measures of LV function. We have strain and ejection fraction. How are they related? You know, for the three dimensional heart, we look at things like pressure volume relationships. Non-invasive, we look at things like ejection fraction as that volume change per stroke is an estimate of myocardial performance and EF is really that surrogate of contractility. So with ejection fraction, we are looking at the three-dimensional influence of the length change to cause that change in volume. So strain and ejection fraction are very much related to one another. Therefore, strain and EF correlate, but there are some important differences. The ejection fraction is influenced by longitudinal, radial, and circumferential shortening. With global longitudinal strain, we are looking only at that one parameter of deformation, and therefore ejection fraction may be normal when global longitudinal strain goes down. Because longitudinal strain has its buddies, circumferential and radial, that can augment its function and maintain things like ejection fraction. There can be much variability in strain measurements, and this variability really starts with us at imagers. So just like the way we look at ejection fraction, there are technical tips we must ensure to maintain as much reproducibility to global longitudinal strain. Now one is looking at things like aortic valve closure. If we look here at this, ye at this yellow line, we can see here, we could measure strain at this point. That would be the peak systolic strain, the peak negative strain during the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. We could measure it at this point, that would be end systolic strain, or we could measure it at this point, the peak strain regardless of the phase of the cardiac cycle. In general, in clinical practice, we look at the global longitudinal peak systolic strain, the peak strain during the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. It is therefore important that we measure aortic valve closure properly because you can appreciate that if you move aortic valve closure too early, you may not appreciate the true peak negative strain and you may underestimate longitudinal strain.
In the apical three chamber view, we want to avoid tracking in the LVOT. Because if we do, what you can see is that measure of strain is much, much lower than if we avoid the LVOT. In the apical views, we want to ensure that when we're tracing, we don't trace past the annulus a little bit into the left atrium. Because again, if we do this, you can see the values of longitudinal strain are much lower than if we track just to the annulus itself. As we will see, there is layer specific strain. Strains may be highest in the endocardial segments and lowest in the epicardial segments. And therefore, if the ROI width is too great, you may have a, again an underestimation in the strain. Here about a 24% difference in the strain values just by changing the ROI width. So as we've just mentioned, there is layer specific strain where endocardial longitudinal strain is a little bit more than the mid-myocardial or epicardial strain. And that would make sense because the layers are linked geometrically to one another. And if during systole, the epicardium was to shorten more than the endocardial layer, you'd literally see buckling of the left ventricle. And even without any intention to really differentiate between layers, software vendors may report by default either endocardial strain or mid or full wall strain, which can be a cause of intervendor differences in strain measurements. Conceptually though, full wall tracking using all the available features of the wall should result in the most robust longitudinal strain estimates. And in fact, the vast majority of available echo strain literature is based on full wall tracking. With that said, could we potentially clinically exploit the concept of layer specific strain? And the answer is probably no, because when we look at an apical view, the simple line density of the echo uh, beam is such that the lateral resolution would be really insufficient for layer analysis. So when evaluating global longitudinal peak systolic strain in an effort to try to minimize at least the human variability in measurements, it's important to look at some factors such as the timing of aortic valve closure. Too soon, you may underestimate longitudinal strain. Avoid tracking into the LVOT or pass the annulus a little bit into the left atrium, both of which may result in an underestimation of longitudinal strain. If the ROI width is just a little too wide, you may again underestimate longitudinal strain. If the apical image is foreshortened and therefore you're not obtaining the value at the true apex where strain is highest, you may again underestimate longitudinal strain. Now, despite being precise in how we acquire and measure global longitudinal strain, there still remains intervendor variability in values due to proprietary algorithms. Now, although they are very similar, there is enough variability such that for clinical practice, if we are following a patient serially over time, we should evaluate parameters of strain using the same vendor software. Now our chamber quantification guidelines tell us that the global longitudinal peak systolic strain in the range of about minus 20% is normal and that we should optimize the image quality, maximize frame rate and minimize foreshortening. And when regional tracking is suboptimal in more than two myocardial segments in a single view, the calculation of GLS should be avoided. What about 3D strain analysis? Now that would be fantastic, right? Because it could measure deformation in any direction as it would avoid any out of plane motion of speckles. So we could then evaluate parameters of rotation. There will be no geometric assumptions, no need for multiple plane acquisitions. So it would be a much faster exam time. However, there's a much lower spatial and temporal resolution. The image quality is less. There remains larger intervendor variability and may not quite be ready for prime time. It's also very important to note that when you see a reduction in strain, this may not necessarily reflect an intrinsic change in ventricular function. And similarly, normal values may not exclude disease as strain can be very sensitive to loading conditions. Here we see an example of a 44 year old male with end stage renal disease. There are two echocardiograms, one on the top and one on the bottom that were done just a few weeks apart. Yet the measures of longitudinal strain were quite different. The difference here 
is that in the second study, the systolic blood pressure was much higher. The afterload had increased. So as afterload increases, strain can decrease. Strain is also influenced by chamber geometry. Here's an example of LV wall thickness. With hypertrophic remodeling and the left ventricular walls becoming thickened, there is more inward motion for a given change in fiber length. Therefore, less longitudinal strain required to eject the same amount of blood. So that when we see, for example, a reduction in global longitudinal strain, it may be due to the increase in afterload, it can be due to hypertrophic remodeling, or it can be due to this intrinsic decline in ventricular function. So we had mentioned just a moment ago that individuals that have a normal longitudinal strain may not necessarily exclude the presence of myocardial dysfunction. Because as you increase preload, you expect to see an increase in longitudinal strain, such that for any given left ventricular end diastolic dimension, an increase in stroke volume requires an increase in global longitudinal strain. Now in this patient here that has a disrupted aortic valve, severe aortic regurgitation, and a spherically dilated left ventricle, you would expect therefore that the global longitudinal strain would increase. So patients with say chronic MR or AR, a GLS of say minus 18% may indicate LV dysfunction and a poor prognosis despite being perfectly within the normal range reported for global longitudinal strain. Similarly, heart rate can influence strain parameters. As we increase the heart rate, you see a reduction in ventricular filling time, a reduction in stroke volume, and you can see a reduction in longitudinal strain. Of course, intrinsic problems of the heart muscle can be associated with a reduction in longitudinal strain. Here we see examples of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Fabry's disease on the right, classic infiltrative disorders such as amyloidosis. The point we're trying to make is that when you see a reduction in global longitudinal strain, yes, it may reflect an intrinsic heart muscle problem, but we also must be aware of the potential impact of loading conditions, the influence of chamber geometry, the impact of heart rate, before defining the fact that this reduction in strain is truly secondary to an intrinsic heart muscle problem. So now we have a very exciting, powerful new tool to add to the echocardiographer's toolbox. And what we need to think about are potential clinical applications. And I think throughout the board review course, you'll see some really excellent examples of this. The one thing I did want to point out here is that not only do we just look at amplitude parameters, but pattern recognition looking at these parametric bullseye maps can be very valuable. We know that in patients with cardiac amyloidosis here, that you have this exaggerated apical sparing pattern. In patients with hypertensive heart disease or aortic stenosis, you see a reduction in longitudinal strain in the basal segments more than in the apical segments, but not quite as exaggerated in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. Or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where strains tend to be lowest, where the walls are thickest. So again, we were reminded not just to look at the amplitude parameters of strain, but the impact of pattern recognition, which may give us insights into the various pathophysiologic mechanisms of disease. What about measures of right ventricular function? Here we see the right ventricle, right atrium, and when we begin to evaluate its function, there are various volumetric parameters, fraction or area change, ejection fraction. There are non-volumetric parameters such as TAPSI, the S prime velocity, possibly the index of myocardial performance. But how then may we potentially use longitudinal strain to help give us insights into right ventricular function? Recall that all measurements of the right ventricle should be made from the RV focused view, including strain. You know, typically the apical four chamber view has been to focus on the LV and to minimize its foreshortening. The consensus is that when measuring the RV, however, one should use the RV focused view. This is a view with a more lateral uh, transducer position with the LV apex at the center of the scanning sector. As we see here, strain parameters of the right ventricle can include the interventricular septum as well as the right ventricular free wall. 
And of course, it does make a difference whether you are looking at strain averaging all six of those segments, whether you're looking at just the free wall strain is what we predominantly use, or whether you're looking at the septal segments. It's also important to recognize that there's a difference in longitudinal strain of the right ventricle in men and women. And that difference is about 2%, being about 2% lower in men than it is in women. So as we go back to this image, what we can see is although we can measure all six of these segments, when evaluating RV longitudinal strain, we tend to just look at these three segments of the RV free wall. And for this reason, we tend to avoid the term global when referring to RV free wall longitudinal strain, more of a descriptive terminology, talking about the three segments that we are actually measuring. So again, what you do is you average these three segments to give us the RV free wall longitudinal strain from the RV focused view. Now the guidelines tell us that a value more negative than about minus 20% would be considered normal. I think clinically and practically, we think more of a value in the range of about minus 25%. So longitudinal RV strain has been reported to have prognostic value in various disease stages such as acute myocardial infarction, pulmonary hypertension, amyloidosis. And as we see here in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, it's really just that RV free wall longitudinal strain that has been shown to have an independent predictive value on event-free survival. Similarly, here we look at the prognostic value of RV free wall longitudinal strain in patients with left-sided heart disease. And you can appreciate that even those that have a normal TAPSI, a reduction in the RV free wall longitudinal strain is able to discriminate those with a worse event-free survival. Again, it's that concept that there may be a warning that there are changes ahead. Now, what about left atrial strain? We generally use simply the apical four chamber view and we begin to trace the endocardial border of the left atrium from the mitral annulus, extrapolating across the pulmonary veins and our left atrial appendage to the opposite side of the mitral annulus, right? We then can derive these parameters of left atrial strain. There is this parameter of left atrial reservoir strain. It's a positive parameter as the atrium gets larger during ventricular systole. There is the conduit strain, which occurs as the mitral valve opens and blood flows from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And finally, there's the contraction strain that occurs during atrial contraction here. Here we just show this uh, graphically with the zero velocity baseline defined here at end diastole where we can see the reservoir strain is from the zero velocity baseline uh, to the peak here. This is a positive value because the atrium is getting larger during ventricular systole. We see conduit strain and finally the reservoir, or excuse me, contraction strain. Reservoir strain, conduit strain, and contraction strain. And here are some proposed sort of normal values. Again, the reservoir strains, they're gonna be positive values as the atrium is getting bigger. And during contraction and conduit phase, when the atrium is getting smaller, these values are, are less. I think it is important to point out that it does make a difference where you define the zero velocity baseline, either on the left here at end diastole or on the right at the beginning of the P wave. And there are a number of advantages to using end diastole. And this is in fact what we generally use because then you can obtain measurements in all patients, whether in sinus rhythm or in atrial fibrillation. And it makes it easier to measure the LA reservoir function, which is probably of greatest clinical interest as this is the parameter that has the largest body of evidence to support its prognostic utility. Note though that when you change the zero velocity baseline from either the end of diastole or the beginning of the P wave, that the LA reservoir strain values will be less, smaller when you use it at the beginning of the P wave. And that makes sense because strain is a relative change in length. And so here you're starting at a bigger value or length before contraction so that the relative change is less. So in our patient here, where we are looking at the LA strain, you can appreciate that the LA reservoir strain is a little bit more when we have the zero velocity baseline at measured at the end of diastole than at the beginning of the P wave, 44.7 versus 37.1%. Uh,
So we had mentioned at the beginning of the discussion that myocardial imaging or strain imaging of the LV may be that warning that there are changes ahead, that the longitudinal strain may go down before we see a reduction in ejection fraction. Perhaps we can say the same for looking at left atrial strain. It may be a warning that there are changes ahead. Here we see left atrial dysfunction despite normal volumetric measures of left atrial size. So the LA reservoir strain may be depressed despite normal left atrial indexed volume. What about left atrial volume in the assessment of diastolic function grades? Right, we know that as the LA index volume increases, that likely is associated with abnormal diastolic function. But what you can appreciate here is that the LA indexed volume is difficult to discriminate between grade one and grade two diastolic dysfunction. This is different though when you look at the LA reservoir strain that the LA reservoir strain continues to decrease between normal grade one, grade two, and grade three diastolic dysfunction. So what then may be some differentiating values, right? What we see here is that LA strain, if it's less than about 24%, that may be at least grade two diastolic dysfunction and less than 19% may suggest grade three diastolic dysfunction. So I hope I've left you that the notion that myocardial imaging is truly becoming this masterpiece for echocardiography, this new tool in the echocardiographer's toolbox. There had in the past been sort of this fog overlaying this masterpiece, things of reproducibility and interventor variability. But as we work through these issues, we're able to wipe away this fog and truly appreciate the masterpiece before us. It is ready for prime time and its utility to detect subclinical both LV and RV dysfunction as we've shown. Its utility in separating out thick-walled cardiomyopathies, its emerging role in individuals with valvular heart disease. As we have discussed, looking at left atrial strain and its evolving utility to assess things such as LV filling pressures. We are reminded that high quality images are a prerequisite for image analysis methods like speckle tracking. And the definition of strain to be measured may significantly influence the results, whether you're looking at endocardium or mid-myocardial strain. And we are reminded that today there still remains interventor variability, and this must be considered when evaluating patients longitudinally. I certainly hope this discussion has given you greater insights into the concepts of myocardial imaging or strain imaging. I really do thank you for your time and attention, and I wish you the best of luck on your board exams.